my life. It's in my DNA. From above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. Oh, yeah. Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby. the size of it. G'day and welcome to Al McGlashan's podcast, the best job in the world. Well, I'll tell you what, after being slack for a while and not working on it for a month, I've been pumping out those podcasts. We did the blue fin, followed up with the swordfish. And you know what we're going to do today? We're going to do Snapper because you guys asked for it and said, we want to talk Snapper. And the great thing is Snapper is something ever since I was a kid, well, I started on them in those early days back down Port Phillip Bay. So when you asked for Snapper, I really liked it. But first, I want to give some feedback to everyone. And I've been blown away by the response. You know, for the podcast for the Swordfish, obviously, Richie, well done, mate. Everyone loved your work there. Uh, Real Action MK, you are pumping out these podcasts quicker than I can catch each species. Still on Kingfish. Well, I'll tell you what, you and me both. But the bluefin are about to arrive. Swordfish is still there, so get out there and go. Uh, what else we have? Love it. Check out our bags. A platform for our bags and consignment from Shop Luxury Stuff. What the bloody hell? All right, what else we got here? Uh, we had Roland K. Rell, big time lister, love it. Gonna go to JB and have a crack at the swords. Bloody oath, and you will catch one down there. I guarantee they're there. It's just a matter of putting in the time and learning about it. Uh, what else we got here? I love doing all this. Just listen to your Bluefin podcast while driving from Bells Beach to Molly Mook. Very entertaining and informative. Look forward to the next one. Any plans on fishing South Africa or Mozambique from into the water? Man, I'd love to go back over there. I fished for swordfish, actually, of all things, out of uh, out of Kenya, but that was as far as I got. So I haven't been back. Well, South Africa did freshwater. I've never done the salt down there. Love to go there and catch a bluefin, or even better, a big yellowfin. Uh, we've also had Real Action MK, we mentioned before, love the podcast. Spending the whole of July chasing bluefin because they're on their way now. They're definitely pushing up the coast. We're just going to wait for this crap weather to stop so we can go and give them a go. And we've also got from the podcast, can you put from Marcel Gazala, can you put these podcasts up on YouTube? Well, I've started doing it. So go to my YouTube channel and you'll find them there. And of course, if you follow on Instagram and Facebook and all these things, you'll be able to keep up to date because we load up everything on there to let you know they're coming up. Then, of course, it's on iTunes and Spotify and, you know, Google Play, I think is the other one. Google Play? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Yep, that's sick. That's awesome. I love all these comments coming back that are all about the positive side. You know, this is the thing for me is that you get feedback on what you're doing and if you like it, tell me. If you don't like it, don't tell me. Tell someone else. I don't care. Uh... JP, JPUX1, podcasts are great. Do you think you can do on Yellowfin? And some of the possible explanations as to why our inshore fishery of Yellowfin on New South Wales have gone. Sadly missed. I'll tell you what, I'll second that. Sadly missed. And I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's do the next one on Yellowfin. But coming up right now, we're going to do Snapper. Now, Snapper are found across Australia, on the East Coast, West Coast, New Zealand, up into Japan. And I think that the Middle East have a species of snapper there too. And I'm not sure if it's the same one. So if you know that it's the same species or not, tell me. Because I can't actually tell you if it is or isn't. And you know the funny thing? It shows I haven't done my homework. I haven't looked it up. But for Australia and New Zealand, they're thick as, and of course, up into Japan. So they're, they're sort of a temperate water species, you know. And for me, it all started as a kid in Port Phillip Bay. I keep going back to Port Phillip Bay. And when I was a kid in Port Phillip Bay, catching a snapper was near impossible. We had those big 
scallop dredges dragging across the bottom and you know pretty much destroying the bottom of the bay because Port Phillip Bay is all soft corals and it was really hard to catch snapper in those days and I still remember my old man had bought me a little probably expensive fishing rod in those days but cheap outfit compared to today and we're fishing there in the shallows off uh, Mandal Eyes or Mornington somewhere down there and I've caught this snapper and you know straight away you know it's a snapper that da, 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 bring it up and I don't think it was size to be honest I hate to admit and I remember letting it go just going no that's my dinner you know that's just such a frustrating thing from that day catching that fish and it was only a little one I was locked in I've always wanted to chase them and they it developed in those days because once they stopped the scallop dredging in Port Phillip Bay, the snapper came back. And for me, the single biggest thing I did in those early days was learn to sound for snapper. So it's an interesting, and we're going to go into different techniques soon because sounding for them, all these different things play such an important role in catching them. But there are species that, you know, catching that fish locked me into it. But you look at it, they're quite across the Indo-Pacific from Japan to even India and New Zealand, temperate water species in Australia, they're, they're plentiful right around the southern half, and I think they go up as far as Exmouth on the west coast. But generally, further south, you know, Geraldton areas like that are really good, probably north of Geraldton. I'm not sure how strong they are. Actually, yes, sorry, Shark Bay. What am I talking about? I've just been to Shark Bay. Shark Bay's actually got a really good fishery all the way around the bottom and then up the east coast as far as, uh, I think it's Gladstone, somewhere up there. You know, that's probably the top end of it. And now Tasmania's started to see a few more turning up in recent times. There were always the odd one there in the Tamar and all that. You'd catch the odd big fish that would push up there to spawn. But these days they seem to be getting more and more. Is that global warming? Well, the top end of the fishery is still staying, or the, the top extremity of the fishery is still staying there. So I'm not sure whether they're being totally affected, but I suspect there would be maybe their home range is actually expanding out. Bit of a question there. Maybe we need to do some research on these little fellas. So they're part of the Sparidae family. Did I pronounce that right? I'm sure someone will complain if I didn't. And they're closely related to brim and all those sort of, but they're just a really good sport fish. Now, snapper for everyone in the US is actually a different species. There, you know, you could bear a snapper, your gropers and all that. That's a different family in Australia. It's actually a different, well, those sort of snappers all come out of the um Lejanid family, which are mangrove jacks and all that. So snapper for us is a different species. Yeah, more, I'm not sure to brim. It's a pokey, I think, over there they catch that looks like it. I'm not sure. Someone, again, come and tell us. So they're really slow-growing fish. Now, snapper can grow to 25, 30 years of age. And do you know what? A 9-kilo fish, that's 20 pounds, can be anything from 16 to 22 years of age. So they're really slow growing when you think about it. What's really interesting, and this is one of the problems we get. A couple of years ago when I caught a big swordfish, I think I actually highlighted this in the swordfish issue. It was 200 and something kilos, which I caught with Richie, who was on the swordfish one there earlier, is that we we killed that swordy, ate the whole thing. So wasted nothing. So people complain, not the greenies, but recreational anglers about killing such a big fish. Now, that fish was probably only about nine, eight to ten years of age. I think it got estimated by the scientists. And one bloke who was yabbering and carrying on like an absolute dickhead was carrying on, yet he was killing snapper that were 10 kilos. So he's killing 25 and 30-year-old fish while I'm killing a young fish. And I tell you what, you get a better retention rate out of what you get back off a snapper. So I'm not saying don't kill big snapper. But as fishermen, we really, really need to think about what happens. So if you kill a fish and you utilize it fully, no problem. But are you doing what's best for the fisher as well? Is that bigger one that's a spawning, you know, the better breeding fish? These are things we need to look at. Sometimes they're not, but don't go carrying on and being a social media troll if you don't know what you're talking about. So it's just one of those things that's just frustrating as hell. So where do snappers spawn? Well, we know they're on inshore, you know, they're coastal and inshore reefs. They don't go out past the shelf that much as far as we know. Pretty much, you know, 50 fathoms generally sees them out. They'll go deeper, but generally speaking, and they spawn inshore. Now, in places like Victoria, they come into the big bays like Port Phillip Bay, Western Port, 
Uh, Corner Inlet has a bit up into the Gulfs in South Australia. They come up the Gulfs to spawn. In uh, West Australia, they come into places like Coburn Sound, Shark Bay, all these places to spawn, which is a good and bad thing because it means they're more accessible. But the problem is it's way less spawning. And this has played a massive issue with the populations. And we should... I'm not going to go into it now, but I will go into it in a minute about what we need to do to look after snapper. Because generally, we know a fair bit now. They spawn when it's around 18 degrees, give or take. So, you know, up into the Spencer Gulf and South Australia, Coburn Sound, Port Phillip and Western Port, they come into the bays, they normally stack up a bit, and then all of a sudden, when the, little, when those, when the conditions are right, they start doing it. But snapper feed during this time as well. And of course, you've got the concentrations, so they can be liable to pressure. And we really need to look at looking after them because they're just too good a fish. In New South Wales, before I go any further, they don't come into the estuary systems as much. You get lots of little ones. Sydney Harbour is full of baby snapper, absolutely full of them. Once they hit about, well, not even a kilo, half a kilo, they all move out into the reefs. And they spawn on those inshore reefs in New South Wales generally a bit earlier than they do in Victoria and South Australia. When it comes to looking after snapper, some states are doing it well and some states are absolutely bloody hopeless. In fact, I've written it up in my column coming up, which is this week, Friday, in the Daily Telegraph. Actually, by the time you read this, it'll probably come and gone, but it'll be online and it's all about looking after snapper because they're such an important sport fish they're good eating fish as well. Some like them more than others. I think they're okay. They're not unreal, but we need to look after them. So let's look at the different states. Recently, South Australia put up, there was a news report there about how they're looking at closing the fishery down. Now, South Australia put all these marine parks in. Going to fix the fisheries, guaranteed. Lock all the anglers out and it'll fix it. Guess what? It didn't fix it. They've put fishing closures in half-assed ones because they go and smash the living daylights out of these fish on open day and the problem with snapper down there is they all congregate on wrecks and certain structure because the gulfs are very flat and featureless so they hammer them and they sell these big and i'm not against commercial fishing but we should not be killing all these big old fish that are spawning fish that goes for wrecks as well we need to limit it so they go and catch the living daylights out on the first day flog them and then send them off. And in fact, someone put up when I when we post on social media about how some of the fishing shows were doing as well. And I agree, we really need to look after these fish. So what's happened in South Australia? Well, that snapper fishery has plummeted. Now they had the biggest snapper in the country and they've stuffed it. And now everyone from Victoria used to go over there and fish for snapper. All those tourism dollars for places like Wyala and all that have all gone because no one goes back. Because regional tourism relies heavily on fishing. If you don't have the fish, no one comes. And the ironic thing is, now Victoria, the fishery is getting better and better. They still fish it during the spawning run, so I'm a little bit up and down on that. I think we should should manage it a lot better, or not manage it a lot better, just be very wary of the results. But what they do in Victoria is they do sample testing to see what what the larvae, so when the snapper is spawned, they do that like a little thin net and they, they scoop up and they can see what the larvae, what the count's going to be, so they can actually estimate what fish, what the fishery is going to be like over the next few years. And as they grow, you're like a two-year-old fish, so in two years we're going to have a good fishery because there was a big population this year. And they tend to come back to the same areas to spawn, like salmon, I suppose. And what's interesting is they're getting a much better understanding of how to manage these fisheries because they look at it and go, look, we've had a really good spawning run. And I think from my memory, and again, I'm not 100% on this, but they actually did a whole lot of research on it and learned that the snapper, the little tiny microscopic baby snapper, were feeding on a microorganism. And there was a specific one that when that flourished or bloomed, they got a lot more snapper. And that was far more important than the fishing and everything else, that if, that, if they had that bloom right, then the snapper numbers would be excessive. This is what it is all about, guys. It's research. It's understanding them fully. It is not about marine park lockouts, trust me. It's about putting seasons in, matching it, giving them a chance to spawn. It's not rocket science. It's really, really simple. 
oh god i sometimes wonder why i harp on about it but it's because i'm passionate like all anglers we want to see lots of fish we want to see lots of fish it's a no-brainer and i'll tell you one state that's done a really good job western australia so in plays like coburn sound now i did a show for fishing with mates on it the boys from complete angler rang me up and said you've got to come over you know we're over there fishing they said you've got to come over and see the snapper they swirl on the surface fins out of the water you can catch them on stick baits and i'm going snapper no way said oh it's closed season not allowed in there and i'm going serious well i'll tell you what i went and did it my mate danny took me out because he's got a special permit and again using anglers where they they tag the snapper because they're trying to learn as much about them as they can so we got a special permit to go and fish coburn sound and in all my life, I never imagined I'd see snapper whirlwinding on the surface with their fins out of the water. It was the most spectacular, awesome, amazing thing I've ever seen. And the footage is unreal. So get this, we're over there, we catch them, you're chucking plastics, those little Halco um, paddle prawns in white. So you drive over and see them swirling on the surface, cast in, bang, you're on. These are seven, eight, nine kilo fish, just one after the other oh my god it's so awesome it's just amazing so we're catching them we're tagging them we're really looking after them letting them go and i said all i want to do is see this i've got to get in i've got to go underwater i want to see this underwater now the problem is we'd had a few sharks up including a white eating our snapper because you know you've got a concentration of snapper you're gonna have sharks and i turned around and said if they come up again i'm gonna get in and swim over to them and we turn around and up they pop and you can't go too close to the boat because they you know, get a bit nervous down again. So I've jumped in and I've swum across to them. And of course, when you're in the water, you don't know where they are. So you're trying to get guided. I've never been so scared in my life. I've jumped in with sharks, but jump in murky water and swimming over. But you know what? When I got there, I, t- I just lined it up perfect, came up. And here's this massive wall of snapper right in front of me. Seven, eight, nine kilo fish just swimming around me. Oh, omg it was the most amazing thing and i'm swimming with them and then they just slowly drifted down the guys have got it drone dino was filming it one of the camos filming it from above so you could see me swimming over and then they disappeared dropped back down and boy i felt alone after that but i got the footage and it's one of those things that i just go how good is this but you know what those fish are protected they're right in suburbia but you can't touch them you can only do it under special permit so you can help research. How good is this for Western Australia? They did a similar thing up at Shark Bay. They had a fishery up there that got decimated because the same thing. Up the back of Shark Bay, they hammered the crap out of them. The fishery depleted down because it's calm all the time. So you can fish them all the time while they're spawning. So they shut it down. Can you imagine some of the other states shutting down a fishery? Well, they did it. And now they've got a really strong fishery. They've got special regulations in place. And guess what? It's all the fishermen that are pushing and supporting it. Fishermen want lots of fish. We don't want lockouts. We want to look after the fishery. You'll always get a few that whinge and complain. But as I said in this week's column in the Daily Telegraph, which is out this week, so by the time you hear this, it'll probably come and gone, but it'll be online, is that it's not, that fisheries management is not a popularity contest. So New South Wales Fisheries and all the others that aren't doing the right thing and aren't managing the fishery, you're not about being popular. You're about doing the job and looking after the fishery. And in New South Wales, can you believe it? They put in all these marine parks, locked the anglers out of all the hot spots. So they left us little spots where there's, you know, no fish. It's like the middle of the paddock where no one stands. You know, they're never there. They're always next to the water. And said, and we were told, and I quote, by the greenies, Even I think the Greens Party, I think they've all been kicked out of New South Wales now, so they're not even in Parliament anymore, thank God, and said there will be lots of fish and all the fish breed in all the marine parks and so there'll be lots of overflow effect. Well, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Are you serious? Which marine parks does striped marlin spawn in? Which marine parks does snapper spawn in? Which marine parks does anything spawn in? They don't know because we don't do the research. The only research they've done in New South Wales, and you might need to sit down to listen to this, they paid for someone to go and film two parts to it. 
The snapper population in plays like Seal Rocks, which used to be a hot spot for fishing. All catch and release when I fished there. Big kings as well. We got locked out because we caught and released fish. So divers could have it to themselves or grano sharks or some rubbish. And do you know what New South Wales Fisheries did? They locked it up and then they turned around and started doing research trying to prove that recreational anglers were sneaking in and stealing the fish. I still can't fathom that this sort of stupidity happens. How on earth can we have people this this stupid? It's just beyond senior management at New South Wales Fisheries allowed this to happen. In fact, why don't I? I'll read out of the paper what we said, or what I said, which was out of the Daily Telegraph. You know, it's this is a quote straight out of it. That uh, Let's have a look here. Anglers have been screaming out for better management and more research to get a clearer picture and ultimately enhance our marine environment. Yet fisheries New South Wales seem to not only ignore requests, but actively target New South Wales anglers, labelling them as villains. Are you serious? These are the people that are meant to be working with us. The recent marine park fiasco, now New South Wales, just to give you a bit of feedback, they tried to lock Sydney up. Yep. Even though you can't fish in large areas of Sydney Harbour and all these spots already, we have fisheries uh, management and plan, which is size and bag limits, which all the anglers are screaming to drop. But this recent marine park fiasco, just the recent marine park fiasco just doesn't seem to want to go away because what happened was they got smashed because the whole of Sydney, the whole community when up in arms that we don't want lockouts. They locked us out everywhere else in the state. They don't, in Sydney as well. Oh, it just absolutely. And it actually helped. The government did a backflip, which is not a backflip. It's actually recognising what the community want because you got it wrong. And Labor still wanted to put it in. So, and it left a bad, because New South Wales Fisheries even announced it on their social pages, on social media, how they're supporting it. That's MEMA, I think it is called, New South Wales. How are they allowed to do this and undermine the rest of the fisheries department? I don't know. This left the community with a bad taste in its mouth, especially anglers who have long been leaders in protecting fish stocks. Now, you'd think New South Wales fisheries would go out of their way to mend bridges after such a balls up. Maybe invest in better management or address the real issues like runoff. Runoff in Sydney is a massive thing. You should see the rubbish pouring into a harbour. And what are the Greens doing about it? Bloody nothing. Invest in better management or address real issues like runoff. But no, instead, they have hidden cameras targeting anglers who inadvertently end up marine parks. So now, because the marine parks aren't working, they're trying to find a way of blaming anglers. This is really mind-boggling and unbelievable and it goes, has gone one step further. In fact, they've even been putting research dollars. Let me read that again. Instead of putting research dollars into better understanding fish species, Fisheries New South Wales has been wasting taxpayers' dollars on beta cameras to assess the supposed impact of illegal fishing on the abundance of snapper in sanctuary zones. Are you for real? Are these people meant to be working with us? Like, oh my God. They're wasting our money to prove that we're in the areas we're not allowed to go. I just, it is beyond me. No wonder New South Wales anglers are so mad. We're pushing for better catch release. We want to better, we want to better understand how to release snapper properly. And I'll actually go into that a bit later on. You know what? This is what I was saying before. In New South Wales, guys, as fisheries managers or Australia-wide, Fisheries management is not a popularity contest. I'm going to say it again because you're not about being popular. You don't want to go and get your photo taken with famous people as I've seen in the past. Just do your job. And the anti-fishing marine estate management authority that is under your control needs to be pulled in and start looking after recreational fishing. Because do you know what? There's something like 900,000 of us, or there used to be in New South Wales. I suspect those numbers are dropping these days because it's so hard. We need to be looking after. We need to get those kids out fishing. We need to get those kids out catching snapper because they shouldn't be in playing video games. If they're listening to this podcast, make sure you do it out fishing, kids. 
it is high time fisheries management accepted responsibility and looked after fish and no more lockouts. And I know I keep harping on giving it to the Greens, but this time it's a direct attack on fisheries. And you know what? They'll probably come and give me a hard time for this, even though I volunteer my time to go and do announcements and do all the things because I want better fishing. Like every other angler in this state, it's about making it better because for me, I don't want sustainable fisheries. I reckon that's crap. I want to enhance it. That's right. I want to enhance it so it's better. So if I go and catch 10 snapper, my kids go out and catch 20. And then their kids go out and catch 40. That's what looking after the environment is really about. All right. I've got to stop talking about it. I know I get so fired up on this. That's it. Back to catch and snapper. Okay. Now, before I go any further, just want to be the professional journalist that I am. I just want to quote that what I read came out of Gone Fishing, which was in the Daily Telegraph, February the 15th, which is a Friday, 2019. Daily Telegraph, or Sydney's Daily Telegraph, and it was called Time to Reel in the Pen Pushers. How good is that? What a great name. Okay, so now you want to catch snapper. Let's get on to the business because this is what everyone asked for, is actually catching snapper. First and foremost, there seems to be two distinct styles of or different areas for snapper fishing where the techniques vary greatly. Victoria and South Australia, the snappers seem to feed a lot more on shellfish as opposed to bait fish. Western Australia and New South Wales, southern Queensland as well, you still catch a lot on bait, don't get me wrong, but bait concentrations of slimies and yakkers or, or bait fish will get you a lot more fish. So you catch them on live baits as well. Um, you even catch them on, you catch a lot on soft plastics, but you even catch some trolling. In fact, I was out with the guys from Halco and we we're trolling deep divers, the good old scorpions and laser pros, looking for mackerel out in the Brolist off Geraldton there. And guess what? We caught snapper and big snapper too. That was amazing. And it plays like New South Wales and Queensland they actually troll quite a bit for them. So that actually brings us to the techniques. So first I'm going to do talk about Victoria and South Australia, which is primarily a bait fishery. You still catch them on soft plastics, don't get me wrong, but the numbers if you want to catch them is on bait fishing. Now for me in Port Phillip Bay, which is where I grew up fishing for snapper, in the early days, what you do is you drive out, you'd anchor up in a spot, You'd know, line up three trees. I'm talking pre-GPS. So for people that don't know, we didn't actually have GPS there when I was a kid. We had to line up trees and stuff. You'd anchor up near Burley. You'd get snapper. It'd work. These days with GPS, you know the spots where they are. But the big thing is, and the most important thing we did, we started to sound for snapper. Now, this works not only in Victoria or Port Phillip Bay in Victoria. Western Port, not so much. But... Port Phillip Bay, down off 90 Mile Beach where they fish those grounds there. Up in South Australia, the key is the bottom's relatively flat. It's soft corals, it's light rubble, it's not heavy reef. And it's an interesting backstory on this because the first time we ever did it is we're driving along, we got the first LMS 350, which was a low ounce, and this is talking. Oh God, I hate to say. I reckon 20 years ago now, at least, and there was no skill. We just drove out. We're driving around with it. And I'm looking at the package and it's got this arch on it. We drove past. There's an arch. Went, oh, wow. That looks like a snapper or a fish. So we anchored up, put the baits in, bang, caught a five kilo snapper. Now, in those days, no one caught snapper. So we're like, ooh. And I was with my old mates, Andrew Pass and Stewie Irvine and all that. We all used to fish together, a little 14 foot tinny we used to drive around. We suddenly went, holy crap. So we drove around again, marked another fish, caught it. Now, the funny thing is you hear about it these days, all these people going, yeah, well, I studied the sounder and I worked out how to find the fish and all that. This was way before then. We had no idea what we we're doing. There was no skill involved with it. We just fluked it. That's all we did. And I still remember my good mate, Trev Hogan, who's pretty much a Melbourne fishing celebrity. So he's run the, uh, what would you say, the, the boat ramp down there at Carrum, which at times put 700 boats through. When these snapper are running, it is packed. And I remember him, the boat ramp, we came in, weighed a couple of fish, you know, five and six kilos or whatever they were, which are huge fish in those days. And he's like, where'd you catch those? I go, oh, out in 18 metres. Everyone fishes in 18 metres because 18 metres is a massive area. And he goes, 
Really? Alrighty, I. Anyway, came in the next day, racing out to do it all again. Leans in the winner. Now, Trev's a big bloke. He's a bit of a big, cuddly bear, but he's a big bloke. So he could be intimidating the first few times for a couple of little bloody 18-year-olds that just got their license. And he goes, you said you're in 18 metres. I went, yeah. And he goes, you're in 21 metres. That blue boat saw you catching fish. I went, oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, 21. Sorry, my mistake. And he goes, why were you trolling? And I thought, we weren't trolling. I said, no, we weren't. He looked at me a bit funny and went fishing anyway. I realised after that it was us sounding. So we were sounding in those early days when no one did it. Of course, the blokes looked at us going, they must be trolling. They were doing the traditional thing. They just anchored up and hoped for the best. And we were actually sounding looking for snapper. And it didn't occur to me till later on. And of course, once we got this wide, we were catching snapper nonstop. And it took a while for everyone to pick up on what we were doing. In fact, my first ever article in Modern Fishing, which used to be the number one fishing magazine, sadly these days it's completely gone, was on Sounding Snapper, which really opened the doors on on the whole snapper fishery. And suddenly everyone was doing it. Now you see boats in Port Phillip Bay driving around everywhere sounding for fish. Because with a flat bottom, and I think actually Port Phillip Bay is only an average of 10 metres deep. It's a massive bay. In fact, it's one of the biggest enclosed bays in the world. So for everyone overseas, Port Phillip Bay is down in Melbourne. So Melbourne's pretty much the suburbia, sprawls around the edge of it. It's a massive, I think it's 100 k's across or 180 k's across, might even be more. It's massive. But the entrance is like 5 k's across. It's huge. So as a result, there's bugger all tidal flow. It's basically shallow. And the snapper come in there every year and spawn. Amazing fishery. And it's really unique because it's got all these soft corals and all these unique things. In fact, David Attenborough and all those guys went and filmed the spider crabs. That was all in Port Phillip Bay. It's an incredibly unique fishery that we obviously have to start looking at because now with suburbia around it, runoff's our biggest problem. So we're polluting the crap out of them. Not marine parks. Again, it's about minimizing the impact of suburbia. It's really important that we look at this. But the snapper fishery is now back up because they took the scallop dredging out. And now the whiting fishing, because they took out the netting, is really starting to kick into gear. But we really still need to look after that fishery. So sounding for snapper is the biggest thing. So how do we do it? Let's just do a brief on sounding. So how do we sound for snapper? So these days I'm using Furuno and stuff, but look, all good units work in shallow water. You don't need to spend the bucks on a big one. A shallow, a, a, a cheaper unit will still work. The wider the beam, the better. And what you do is you sound around, sound around as slow as you can that you're still reading the bottom well. And what we do is we zoom in. So you actually zoom in one side of your unit. So you I don't know, expand out the bottom to get the clearest picture. And as you're sounding around, you're looking for arches. Now, when you're sounding around, the fish comes up as an arch. That is not because of the air bladder. What it is, is that the sounder sends down a signal and it bounces off any. So it goes through the water. So anything that's denser than water, it bounces off. Air is denser than water or different, different density to water. So it'll bounce off that. But the fish is a different density. It's not the same density as water. So the bigger the fish, the bigger the return. But why you get an arch or an eyebrow is because of trigonometry. So you've got a cone. That's how your sounder works, your beam. So it expands out as it goes down. If you hit the fish on the edge of that, you get a little bit of an arch. If it goes all the way through, because it's basic trigonometry, the center of a triangle is less than the sides. So it will actually go up. That's why you get, and of course at the ends, it thins out because you're only just getting a bit. But when it's at its most intense, it's directly below in the center of the beam. Does that make sense? Different sounders read it different ways. You can, obviously, with more expensive gear, you can make them as a flat line because you're going faster. There's a million different things. The one thing you need to know, or more importantly, be confident in your unit. So whichever unit you run, understanding it and interpreting that picture is the key to finding snapper. So in plays like Port Phillip Bay, you go around slowly, you mark it up, you start seeing fish, you then drive into the wind and anchor up, and they're all using electric anchors now. How good is this? In my day, I had to lift it up and by hand every time. We might change spots 50, 30 times in a day. You should see my guns. Yeah, they're not that big, actually. They're not that big after all. And then you'd anchor up. So wherever that mark was, or wherever those marks, hopefully multiple ones, is out behind the boat. 
Then you'd cast a fan of rods out over the back. And I think you can run four rods per person in Victoria. Again, I'm not sure of the rules. Make sure you check the rules and abide by them. And the idea is then is you fan those rods out and use very lightly weighted baits. So a circle hook's absolutely darn it up around the head. That's another important thing. Always rig the bait with the hook in the head because snapper will always eat it head first. And that doesn't matter whether you're up here in New South Wales, which I'll go into New South Wales techniques or other techniques and other locations in a minute, but you still need to make sure it's rigged in the head. And then as that bait drifts down, the snap will eat it. And in the old days, we used to run the old Shimano bait runners, which the late John Dumphy actually designed. So John Dumphy is the head of Shimano, or was the head of Shimano. He brought it into Australia when it wasn't a big brand and built it up. And he actually designed the bait runner mode. How good is that? Australia, you're leading the way in technology. So the bait runner style, because it used to use, and his story, I remember interviewing about him, said that he was sitting there, I think he was fishing for brim, and he was using overheads, but he wanted to use spin gear, but you couldn't do it with spin gear because you couldn't put that light drag. So he got them to design it and build it up. And of course, today, it's one of the things that Shimano led the way on. These days, we don't use the bait runner as much. We just use light drag with circles because you want pressure. Again, everything's evolving. Cast those rods out, let them sit, and all of a sudden, as soon as the rod goes down, you just pick it up softly, and you're on. And when those snapper are going, it can go off its tree. Absolutely insane fishing. While we're still on the subject of Victoria, use a mix of baits. They love sand whiting if you can get fresh squid, and I mean catching the squid, not buying the squid. You know, it's really important. Anything like that, if you catch bait. So one thing we used to do while we're fishing in the deeper water there, you get little barracuda, garfish, all those sort of things. Anything like that can be a bait as well. Even a flathead, you know, flathead fillets, anything fresh. Snapper are really fussy. Now, in New South Wales, if we just jump across into New South Wales, the technique that used to be the one and only is you'd anchor up and you'd use floaters. So sort of similar to Victoria, you'd find the reef, you know, a reef edge, you'd burly up and then you'd float a bait down, maybe slightly weighted down the trail, almost like fishing for yellowfin, and the snapper would come up and eat it. Big fish heads and stuff like that worked a treat. You'd get all your matoes and sweep and all that up, and the snapper would be behind. Sometimes you'd cast it over the back of them, get past the bait, and the big snapper would be lurking out the back. For my mates that are spearos, this is a similar thing. Paul Miller shot one of his big snapper ever off Sydney, which was, I think, 13 kilos off Long Reef. Like, what a monster. And he burlied up. And just let them come in and, you know, and same thing. And it was when he let, it was, I think it was the head of a salmon or something, went to drift down the trail, that snapper raced up and ate it. What that tells me is they love the heads. The beauty is, too, that the crap fish like the matoes and the wrasse and all the other things that are eating it will leave the head alone, but the snapper will smash it. Again, if there's a little tip I can say there, have the hook points fully exposed. When it comes to leaders and stuff, Port Phillip Bay, you can drop it right down. You don't have to use heavy leaders in there. Um, I'd go right down to, you know, 20 pound at times. The trick is, and this is what's really important, make sure you check that leader out regularly because you've got oysters and all these things on the bottom. If you've got little nicks in it or anything like that, just make sure you're onto it. You're checking it, you're looking at it, all that sort of stuff. If it's any scratches or abrasions, cut it off and retie it. Suffix is a really good one. Use the fluoro. Fluoro can be good, especially in heavily fished areas. In New South Wales, fish a lot heavier because you're in kelp beds and places like that. The fish often sit on, you know, rubble edges, but there's kelp and there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot heavier reefs. So upgrade everything in New South Wales. Now, the other technique, which is, this is for Western Port Bay, which is, just around the corner from Port Phillip Bay in Victoria, but it's a completely different bait. There's lots of current, it's more structure, it's different fishery, which is actually very similar to South Australia, where you've got a lot more current. So in these spots, you anchor up on specific areas. In South Australia, there's old wrecks, there's a lot of legal wrecks there that they put stuff down, like rubble patches. You still sound around to see if there's fish on them in South Australia. Western Port, not so much. Western Port's very tidal, and that's probably the key. Um, you fish the edge of the reef or the edge of the channel. Well, South Australia, you sit, you know, you find rubble patches or old wrecks are always really good for snapper. 
and you anchor up and you fish that tide change. Because when the current starts to slow, the snapper go bananas. And this is for everywhere. Snapper love the tide change. Just before a tide, they go off. So it's really important to plan your fishing for a tide change. Also, dawn and dusk. An interesting thing is, early in the season, plays like Port Phillip Bay, dawn is the prime time. Just on daylight, they go off. Other places, not so important. So that's where local knowledge and going into a local complete angler or something like that is really important. When we're fishing Western Australia, you go and see Big Phil at Complete Angler or Brian or guys out at Gosling. Find out what is the key for that local area. I cannot stress this enough. It's so important. And then you anchor up and you actually fish baits on the bottom. In Western Port, one of the tricks they do is you actually, because there's a lot of weight, you can pad an oster style fish if you want, which works in plays like New South Wales for small fish where you drift and just catch a feed. But if you want those big ones, you actually have a running sinker, which is, well, they call them easy rigs, and your sinker actually sits. So when a fish grabs the bait and runs, it doesn't feel the weight of the sinker. So you can still let it run, and then you can hook it up. You get gunny sharks and all these other things as well. It's a really clever style of fishing, and that way you can fish a little bit more of the current and particularly up on the banks and plays like that. But areas like Western Port, local knowledge is the key. And again, go in and see the complete angler stores down there. There's a bloody heap of them around in Victoria, and they're all mad keen fishermen. In fact, the other day we were doing videos for the complete angler, and we were doing it for Ringwood and for Dandidong and talking about snapper fishing, because they all love snapper fishing. So if you're new to it, drop in and ask the guys and get the info, particularly Western Port. Port Phillip's a bit of an easier fishery, but yeah, learn and then just put time in on the water. South Australia, same thing. Talk to the guys there, get the info from the angler stores and you will catch, well, South Australia's a bit tougher these days, but you'll still catch fish if you put the time in. Another style of fishing, and this one I really, really like, soft plastics. Now, I remember when it started, I started hearing about it in New South Wales and it was people started catching a lot of fish and we started doing it. I came up here and started catching them, just went, holy moly. So how do we catch them on soft plastics? Well, it's all about finesse and you're stalking the fish. So in plays like Port Stephens, especially Seal Rocks, before we got locked out, what you do is you get up in the shallows anywhere. And when I mean shallows, it's 12 to 25 metres of water. You're fishing the reef edges, the rubble patches, the light reef, even the heavier reef at times, but you do get snagged up a bit more. Never drive over the area you're going to fish. You stop and then you drift through that area, casting. And again, so you use um, oh, three eighths size jigs. The guys at Hook'em gave me these really good ones, but use that heavy duty head on it. So like you need the hooks to really, they need to be solid. No mucking around with this stuff. So the reason why you need these really heavy hooks is because a snapper's mouth is incredibly tough. And in most cases when you hook up, it's not you hooking it with by striking, it's actually the fish hooking itself by biting down. Because it's like putting a it's like putting a hook into a piece of wood. And the problem you get, because this is I suppose you look at it this way, is a snapper eating stuff like, you know, mussels and fish heads. They're they're pretty tough little buggers. So when they crush that bait to swallow it, of course the hook just goes straight in. And we've found a lot when we use the lighter hooks while fighting the fish is they bend out. So you, you don't need to run heavy gear. You just need that heavy duty hook and it has to be pin sharp. I mean razor sharp. Now on top of that, when it comes to rigging your plastic, like you've got your, your big paddle prawns from Halco, you've got to make sure it sits perfect on the hook. This is a mistake fishermen do across the board from brim to snapper. If that bait, if that plastic is not sitting perfect, it will spin. If it spins, it does not work. I don't know why, but a spinning bait does not catch fish. So if you've got any doubts that it's not sitting properly, put it beside the boat, drop it in, jig it a few times and just see what it does. If it sits, if it swims weird, Pull it off and do it again. This is where the finesse comes into this style of fishing, and it really is essential. Now, as I was saying before, 
is that you drift over the area and you're casting forward. So you're casting downwind, so the wind will help you get your cast even further. You're letting the soft plastic sink down. Now be ready because the snapper will often hit it on the drop. We've even had snapper in 20 metres of water take it off the surface. The key there is slimy schools. And I was saying earlier on about find the bait. If you see slimy schools, the snapper will be on the edge. Now, years and years ago, I was filming Riveter Reef. Oh, my God, that was a few years ago now. And I took the guys to Coffs Harbour. And we're fishing around. We caught a heap of kings. Then we went across to one of the other reefs. And there were kings on top. And what we were doing was casting the plastics around the edge. If you didn't twitch it and let it go down, you'd get past the kings. And underneath were snapper. So it really is. It's similar to marlin fishing that... Find the bait, you'll find the snapper, and especially those slimies in yakka schools. Wherever they're concentrated, they'll be hanging on the edges. So when you cast out and you twitch, it's obviously imitating just you know, a wounded bait fish or something that the snapper are all over. And I've seen this a lot when I've been diving, is watching where you see the, the snapper are there and then the um, all the underwater, like all the, the bait fish are balled up. You've got the pelagics on top, but snapper and other sort of demersal predators will hang around those edges as well. So find that bait and you're watching the sounder as well as you're going, as you're flicking. And so keep casting out ahead as you're going. And once it hits the bottom, lift it up so it strikes up and then comes down. And you can work it up off the bottom a little bit, particularly in areas that have got kelp and heavier reef. Keep it up off the bottom a bit. The bite nearly always comes on the drop. So be ready. Use the rod to lift up and then wind up the slack as you drop. If it goes hard, strike in and load up on him. In places like New South Wales, you've got to go hard because they wrap you up in the kelp. Victorian areas like that with soft plastics, you're usually pretty good. There's not too heavy a reef. Whilst up in other areas like Queensland, yeah, not so much kelp, bit of coral up there can be a problem. So Harvey Bay, those sort of areas, they can be, but they generally seem to sit on rubble. Western Australia is pretty good, except areas like the Abrolhos, where, of course, you're surrounded by coral, which can be, yeah, it can be a little bit tough on you there. So... As you're doing it, now the size of your plastics you use, I like the bigger sort of the five inch ones. The flick sticks, the, generally white is my favorite color, but you know what, snapper, it can be anything. And as I said before, three eighths through to about a half, yeah, about a half is generally good, but it's about getting it, whatever, whatever size head you need to get into the strike zone is what the priority is. And what I normally run is two outfits. So I have one with a half ounce for deeper water, one with a three-eighths or even a quarter when we're up in the shallow or when the drift's allowing you to get it down because if the wind picks up, you're going to need a heavy head. So again, it's using that finesse and being able to work it to match the conditions and the terrain. Tell you what, those bites are awesome. There's days there where you can get really good fishing on them that, you know, I remember doing it and you're getting fish sort of five, six, seven kilos all on plastics. It's bloody good fishing it is really really fun it probably without well without fail it is my favorite way to target snapper i talked about earlier about using a sounder now the terrain it really is that inshore reef in new south wales but the rubble patches work really well so not on the reef just on the edge which generally seems to be a little bit deeper water they favor there victoria of course it's the the mussel beds the scallop beds th that real light gravel that they seem to like and same in um South Australia, although in both cases, you also get a massive, you know, any structure. So a lot of guys have put their own structure down, not always legal, but it enhances the environment and the snappers tend to concentrate on it because all the life comes around it. Because imagine like it's an open paddock, you put one tree in there, well, the cows are going to be around the tree. So the snapper and all of everything's going to hang around any structure. So finding structure, and that goes back to using your sounder. And of course, once you find it, mark it on your GPS. You will find, and I've heard some great stories about people thinking they own it. So you pull up and start fishing on a spot, and then someone's turned up going, this is my spot. Well, I'll tell you what, it's not your spot. It's everyone's spot. So that old school attitude, get rid of it. Because those people, I tell you, I've met a few of them over the years that, you know, threaten you and carry on. I got threatened in South Australia years ago chasing kings because we were filming it because it was their kings. It wasn't our kings. I was just sit there going, the only way forward, guys, is working together. And so if you've got that old school attitude, you're not going to make it in this world, especially now with social media. you got no chance. And if you do pull up with someone else's fishing, show some respect on the exact same note and don't fish on top of them. Don't fish behind them. 
anchor up to the side, working together, because that's the future. At the end of the day, there's more pressure on our, our fisheries, so all the anglers at least need to work together. You've got bigger problems, guys. You've got to deal with greenies that want to lock it up. They want to stop you fishing and then eat canned tuna or something. So they're so out of touch, it's ridiculous. And you've got your own fishermen. And then you've got, you know, all these marine park fiascos and government departments that don't seem to want to listen to fishermen for whatever reason. If there's anyone needs to stick together, it's fishermen. All right, I've digressed again. Back to the subject. Okay. When it comes to tackle, this is a really good part. Because when I started, I was using, you know, six and eight thousand size bait runners and heavy glass rods. Now, to fish the very same fish in Port Phillip Bay, I'm running a maximum of four thousand size rule, even down to two and a half. Light, you know, GLX rods, which are those G Loomers, which is obviously Shimano these days. It is an absolute pleasure to fight these fish. It's really glorified brim gear, really. Like, it's not that good, but you get the great fight out of them. The old days of cranking them up, that's gone. Even in New South Wales where we're fishing in heavy, heavy terrain, a Shimano 4000, like a, you know, Stratic or something like that, is perfect with a, oh, look, a two-meter rod will do the job. This is where it comes personal. The rod that suits you for your casting. Go and see the boys at Complete Angler or something and ask them, and just play with a couple. Which ones feel good? Put the reel on it. Check and see which one feels nice. When it comes to braid, suffix. I love this stuff. 20 pound is perfect in most cases. Your leader, 20 to 40, somewhere in that range. Again, fluorocarbon suffix is really good for it. It depends on what style you're doing. You know, if you're in heavy terrain or chasing bigger fish, use the heavy one. But keep checking your leader. If there's any question it's not working or it's got a wear and tear on it, cut it off and retie it. Uh, when it comes to hooks, super sharp. As I was saying before, the bait, the hook needs to match the bait. So if you're using, say, pilchards, you can run a smaller hook, like a four row. If you're running bigger baits, like a slimy head or something like that, go up to seven o. like an octopus is really good. Circles are even better because you hook them in the mouth, which is really important for two things. One is if the hook's in the mouth, it can't chew on the leader. And snapper have quite quite serious teeth because they're designed for grinding shells and you know chewing on fish heads and stuff. So when they're doing that, your leader gets caught. They chew through it really quickly. So if you can mouth hook them, you've got a much better chance as well. It's And this brings me into the last part of this, this whole talk, which is about looking after these fish which is really, really important. It's about letting them go and, and what we need to do. Because in the future, we're already seeing it. We've got the Dave Irvine competition up at Coffs Harbour, which is where they let them go. But you can't just let snapper go. Snapper, they suffer barotrauma. They can't be dragged in the boat and chucked on the floor. They need to be really looked after. They will live if you look after them. So first thing is, Shallow water is the best one for letting them go. Inside 15 metres is a general rule. They seem to survive better. The second thing is, well, actually the most critical thing is hook placement. If you hook them in the guts and you cut it off and say they'll be fine, they're not always fine. You're better off eating that fish and then letting the bigger one go that's hooked in the mouth. So that comes back to what I was saying about hooks. Circle hooks are obviously going to hook in the mouth a lot better. J hooks are going to gut hook and do damage. And I've done it, it's interesting, over the years when we've caught a couple, we've pulled out the hooks to have a look or cut open the stomach to have a look and yeah, they do some damage. You do not want to gut hook them unless you're taken home for a meal. So that's where circles are better. Of course, when you're using plastic and even lures, I haven't really touched on lures. You can troll lures. We were doing it, as I said earlier on, over in West Australia, trolling deep diving scorpions and or RMGs along the edge of the coral and catching snapper. It's actually quite a good technique. One thing I'd do, press down the barbs. On soft plastics, just make sure it's razor sharp. You don't have to put, press down the barb on that because if you can get it through, it might help. Some people do, some don't. And it's just making sure all your gear with snap, especially in that heavy terrain, is in one piece because I tell you what, they are seriously tough little fish. Oh, and one more lure before I forget is the Halco Whiptail. It's a bucktail jig. A lot of people don't know about it but it is deadly on snapper. They love it. It's got a heavy head on it, so you can sink it down into the zone. When we were fishing in the brolis with the guys, man, they blissed with it. 
didn't outfish the plastics, but it was pretty close. But so definitely keep an eye out for that. Uh, let's go back to it. Okay. So for looking after fish, if you're keeping it, put it on ice. I tend to bleed mine, gut and bleed, uh, gut and gill them straight away. Uh, but you definitely want to bleed them and get them on ice. You see these photos of all these snap, beautiful snapper that have been sitting on the deck or in a fish bin and not even on ice. Even commercially, I've seen it. Like, what the hell are you guys doing? If you keep it, look after it. It's not only a sign of respect for the fish, but God, you put all this effort and money into it. You may as well retain, get as much back out of this fishing trip as you can. If you're going to catch a fish and eat it, take it all. Take the wings. Learn to fill it properly. Scrape the meat off the backbone. Take every off. Hey, I'll tell you what you could even do is use the fish head soup, snapper heads. And I remember years and years ago, the old blokes from Modern Fishing used to do it. Oh my God, it was beautiful. Definitely do it outside because it doesn't smell that nice when you actually do it, but it is unreal. So yeah, razor sharp hooks, really important. Um, going back to releasing. Hang on, I keep digress digressing off here. Okay, hook placement, as I said, is really important. You want to minimize handling with the fish. So if you want to photo, get the camera ready. Get everything ready before. Keep the fish in the water. He can be in the net, sit in the water. He'll be more relaxed there. Get the camera ready. Get the sun over your shoulder. Go, right, instruct your angler or now your talent where to lift the fish up, how to hold it. Right, one, two, three, hold it up. Bang, 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 bang. There you go. Photo's taken. Right, put the fish back in the water. Obviously, probably unhooked it by now. And then hold it. Do not throw it in. You see this one, a couple of fishing shows, and I really, really hate it, have this habit of spearing it in the water. Just put the bloody fish in gently. Unless you've got issues with sharks or seals or crocodiles, you don't have to spear it in. Just put it in gently and let the fish recover. You don't need to move it in the water either. The water's moving down there. They will get the oxygen through their gills in seconds and start working and let them swim off. And I'll tell you what, for me, Watching that snapper just slowly swim off is the best feeling. And I've jumped in a few times and done a bit of underwater and watched them, and they absolutely just cruise off. It's beautiful to watch. And they, they all seem to be quite happy, you know. They've been really good, and they seem to be unstressed about that side. So, And, of course, when you do lift it up, always support the fish. Always hold it up and gently. So don't hold it by the tail. Put your hand underneath and hold him. And generally, if you hold them, don't squeeze him, because if you squeeze him, you'll try and flip and get out of your hands, and you don't want to drop the poor bugger. So always support it, and then get it back in the water as quick as you can, and let it go. And I'll tell you what, these days, a big snapper is just too important to kill. I'm going to say it, we've got to look after them. There aren't enough out there. For us in New South Wales... It's really tough these days. We don't see them anywhere like we used to. The guys are letting them go. As I said, the, the Dave Irvine comp, they're all letting them go. We really need to make sure we're letting them go right so they're all swimming off. But we've got to look after these fish because I won't let my kids to go and catch heaps of snapper. And off Sydney, you don't even go snapper fishing anymore. It's absolutely cleaned out. It's just, yeah, combination of pollution. We are fishing them pretty hard and obviously they keep them. You know, there's nothing wrong with keeping them, but we need to really minimize bag limits and up the size limits and just start looking after them because you know what i caught snapper as a kid and i want my kids to do it as well well there you have it snapper what an awesome fish we do need to look after them i know i harp on about marine parks and all the other things but putting up an invisible fence does not fix the problem what we want is research we want to understand these fish we want to understand where they go and how they work because that's how we can look after them because you know what going forward we need lots of snapper. They were buggered when I grew up as a kid. We made it better. So it's our responsibility to make it even better. And we're paying you guys at fisheries to do it. So there's no excuse. I'm not into the politics. I don't care about, you know, ministers not liking someone else or whatever. It is a responsibility that you have to the community. And the anglers are leading the way, as usual. So the podcasts have been, well, let's just say overwhelming to say the least. I thought doing TV was big, but podcast, oh my God, how good is it? And you know what? I finally realized I've got a voice for radio. I can't believe I just said that. My good looks should never be hidden. Okay, so going forward, tell me what you want. Everyone's powering you. Send it to it on Instagram, the YouTube channel. We'll put more and more stuff back up on there. 
Facebook, uh, it's a bit of a hate book these days. But yeah, put your comments on there as well if you want, unless they're bad ones, I don't want to hear those. No trolls for me. The only trolling we should do is on the water. And tell us what you want going forward. And if you want more of, you know, more stuff with Richie with doing swords or you want more stuff with doing bluefin, more of that information, let me know and we'll add that in as well. And we can even look down the track at hunting and, and diving and underwater photography, all these other areas that everyone seems to be really interested in. But for now, I'm going fishing and enjoy the podcast. Fishing is my life. It's in my DNA. From above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. Oh, yeah. Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby. The storms are going up around. Look at the size of it. Oh, I'm Elmer Glashen. Woohoohoo!